Hi, I'm Dr. Lauren Spring. And I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. And this is My My Favorite Favorite Lesson. Lesson. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to My Favorite Lesson, Season 2. For regular listeners, um, you're in for a treat. This season is going to be quite different than Season 1. For one thing, um, I'm here with a co-host, my colleague and friend, Sarah Kafashan. Do you like hi. to say hi, Sarah? Hi, everyone. So good to be here with Lauren on this podcast. We're so excited for this season. Yes, and together, Sarah and I are going to be exploring some really big questions with faculty. Um, our general theme of this particular season has come out of both our own lived experience and a lot of conversations we've been having with faculty at the college, other friends who are working in academia, and we're really going to be exploring faculty identity, specifically around um, faculty who teach disciplines that have emotionally complex topics as a key part of course learnings. And I will say, this is a bit of a launching pad because Sarah and I are going to be involved in a much bigger research project on this theme, but we thought we may as well start things off by sharing a little bit about why we're interested in this topic and having some you know, pretty lengthy and deep discussions with faculty who are living this right now. Um, do you want to share, Sarah, some of the other questions we're, we're interested in exploring on a broad level? Yeah, for sure, Lauren. So our research question is really looking at faculty identity and how our identities as faculty inform our teaching philosophies for disciplines, as, as, as Lauren said, are emotionally complex or, you know, courses that we're teaching that have an emotional charge as a key part of the course learning. We're really also interested in understanding how this notion of lived experience comes into play when we're teaching. Does lived experience make an educator better at teaching these subjects? Why or why not? And what type of pedagogical tools do faculty use to adjust these subjects? So do we, do we bake in our personal stories when we're teaching? Do we use specific active learning strategies? Do we use the role of aesthetic force, a concept that Lauren and I will talk more about later. We're also really interested in faculty mental health. What toll, if any, does it take on um, does it take on faculty members to teach emotionally charged topics and courses? And as you'll hear on this episode, this is a, a really kind of fun introduction because Sarah and I both have experience teaching courses like this with yeah. emotionally difficult content. And over the years of doing this, we've learned a few things. I think in some cases, things have felt really right. And in other cases, it it hasn't felt so good. (laughs) And, you know, we've asked ourselves, wow, am I really the best person to be doing this job at what at what cost? Um, And why do I keep doing it? Why do I keep returning? (laughs) And, uh, you know, what what's sort of driving me in this respect? So and we know from our conversations with faculty that that many folks feel similarly. So this is what we're going to explore together uh, this season. It's going to be shorter. We'll just have a a handful of guests. And in this first episode, Sarah and I are going to be interviewing each other because we thought it's only fair if we're going to have faculty on this podcast sharing some of their stories and their feelings about teaching um, in these, you know, pretty profound ways. It's only fair that we do the same. So the next, (laughs) the rest of this episode is really us interviewing each other and sharing our entry points into this research and some specific examples of, you know, how we've grappled with some of these questions and strategies and methods that we've brought into our own teaching. So <clears throat> let's do it. Let's do it. Sarah, <laughs> I'm going to ask you some questions first. Okay, here so we go. <laughs> can you let me know one of the first times that you experienced this? So when you were asking to teach something that sort of hit close to home, related to your own lived experience in some way and, you know, whether you felt either obliged or inspired um, to share your own lived experience because it could enhance learning or connection with, with others. Yeah. Um, So I think one of the first times, or at least what's coming to mind right now is this position that I had, it was a part-time contract as part of my graduate studies that I did where I was placed within a regional department of a national mental health organization or institute. And I had a part-time contract for about four to six months. And I was building educational content, a curriculum and program of of which I delivered 
towards the community. And it was about coping with trauma. And I really kind of was struggling with, with this idea of, you know, how much of myself do I share? Do I share, you know, my own lived experience? Um, you know, is this going to help community members who are coming to this program to relate to me? Will it cause them to question my credibility of any sort? Um, interestingly, the position was also, I got the position based on having to disclose some lived experience. Mm. So I had to spend, um, you know, some time in the application process, at least, you know, making note that I am someone who has lived experience with, you know, the topic that I'm going to be teaching about. And so, and you mentioned that this, <clears throat> this is connected to your graduate studies. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering maybe how much pressure you felt in that moment to disclose, right? If you kind of had to do this practicum <laughs> to, to finish your degree and then on the application, they're saying, Hey, you know, disclose that you've had this history of mental health struggles. Would you say you felt pressure or were you buying into the model? Like, actually, this is a better, a better way of providing peer support. And you want someone with lived experience to take on this role. Yeah. I mean, that's such a great question because how I was feeling was very torn. Um, you know, by this point I had several degrees in psychology and I had been really kind of indoctrinated in, in the training Right. And, and the training was really all about, you know, to be a quote, good or, or professional psychologist, you really need to be objective, hmm. right? You need to be kind of distanced, this kind of traditional idea of what it is to be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a, a therapist, right? I kind of permeated the field for me. And so I was struggling with that because, you know, I, it, it's something that was indoctrinated in me. But I also was starting to connect a bit more with this this other side, another kind of philosophy that was rising up that was all about peer support. And really this idea that, you know, experts who are objective and distant from, quote, the subject matter or the mental illness or the mental ailment are, are really the, the voices at the forefront. Instead, it should be the people who have these lived experiences. They know what's best for them. And so... I had a tension between those pieces personally for me. I was I was worried about how, you know, it was going to be perceived by other people um, and also scared. It was it was my first time venturing into mental health work. And it was something I had wanted to do mm -hmm. since I was very young, um, you know, probably in my teenage years. So it it all felt so high risk. And there wasn't there wasn't a lot of um, support or advice from from folks because no one was really talking about their lived experience, or at least in my immediate circle that I could see. Mm -hmm. And from this perspective of like, we're thinking mental health and what peer support could bring instead of, you know, this one-on-one -on -one <laughs> relationship with a psychiatrist or something. It sounds to me like sort of politically that had been a shift. I don't know if politically is the right word, but just you know, practice wise, there had maybe been some recognition that, wait a second, maybe this distance that you're saying you were trained, you know, all throughout your, your academic training in psychology to, to adopt, maybe that's actually not the best way to connect with people. Um, and then this sort of whole new area opening up, okay, what, what does a different model look like? And so when you did take this on and, and ended up supporting peers, what, what did that feel like? How was that <laughs> to be in it from that perspective while also having, you know, ingrained in you that, oh, this objectivity is sort of, you know, the norm? Yeah. So I think it led to a lot of confusion for me, right? So in, in some ways it was really nice to, because when I would share a little bit about myself, I, that's when I would get a lot of kind of you know, what we might call positive feedback from the participants or the community members, right? They would, I was kind of role modeling a little bit of sharing about myself. And so they would mm -hmm. share a little bit as well, but I was always unsure. And I would always kind of go to my direct report and say, you know, is this too much? Is this too little? Am I doing it right? You know, I was really concerned because, well, it felt like really important work to me, yeah. right? Um, it was, it was something near and dear to my heart. Um, I have family members who have lived experience of, of mental health and trauma. And so I wanted to, you know, get it right. Mm -hmm. uh, but there wasn't really a model or mm -hmm. there isn't a step-by-step -step plan, right, as we know. And so 
I had to do a lot of experimenting, um, knowing that, you know, at the time, all the, you know, leaders in mental health that I looked up to, none of them were sharing anything personal. Right. Right. There wasn't, there wasn't a model that I could map on and say, Hey, this person who has 25 years Mm -hmm. of experience did it. And now they're seen in this way, right? There wasn't any of that that I had seen at the time. So it was a lot of trial and error and a lot of um, heart work, I call. Mm -hmm. So, you know, kind of stress on the heart, wanting to do it right, you know, kind of this, this, this strong tie to, to making sure that, you know, what I was doing was, was helpful for others uh, in the program and, and doing justice to a topic that I was so passionate about. And it is, I mean, my experience working with folks, you know, seeking treatment for mental health struggles too, it's such a beautiful sort of vulnerable time, right? When, Mm -hmm. when someone's going through a transition like that or connecting to people and opening up in certain ways that, that I hear you, right? That the, it seems like that's a really high stakes (laughs) situation to, to be helping guide and support those conversations. Yeah. And when, when there's no roadmap of, okay, how much do I share about myself, et cetera, um, can be really tricky. Mm -hmm. To me, it makes me think a bit about academic settings too, right? If students have signed on to take a course about a particularly charged, emotionally difficult subject, everyone's sort of agreeing to be there just like they would in a group therapy (laughs) session. Right. Um, and, and similarly, I feel like, you know, faculty would have that pressure of like, okay, I've got to, I've got to guide these conversations in a direction that's meaningful, that's respectful, that, that, you know, isn't going to cause anybody shame or whatever. Mm -hmm. And how much do I share? So I feel like there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, even when we look at, um, you know, just thinking about like what, let's say there's an elective course, you know, what makes students have the desire to sign up for a course that's emotionally mm-hmm. charged? Um, you know, Lauren, you and I were joking about how a lot of research is me search. Yeah. This idea <laughs> that, you know, you you do research to kind of understand yourself. But I think that that can be applied wider here of even students who choose to take courses. Right. Yeah. Um of course, these are courses that are not part of a set program, but if they're electives, the ones that you choose uh, could, could, as you say, hit close to home and you're in there for a reason. Yeah. yeah. So I imagine this happens a lot uh, in, in faculty programs and, and you know, informally, uh, having gone through psychology training in grad school. So, you know, I'm a social psychologist. I'm not a clinician. That means I don't practice therapy. Um, but all of us, you know, informally without professors there, would kind of talk a little bit Mm -hmm. about what brought us there. Right. And so we kind of knew, but we also knew there's this distance, you know, you would never share that in front of the classroom. We were all teaching while doing research and you wouldn't share that or bring that up necessarily, uh, in front of your advisors or or other professors. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, you talk a lot about that sort of, you know, heart work that you're, when you were engaging with, you know, other people in, in the practicum, et cetera, do you feel like, did your heart ever get so caught up in, in what you were seeing and, and discussing there that you questioned like, whoa, am I actually the best person for this job? Like, is my lived experience here and my open heartedness, like a, you know, a liability? <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. That happened a lot in the first, in the first little bit, uh, of this position. So because it was a peer support model, which really kind of, um, prioritizes lived experience, right? So everyone there, including the facilitator has to have lived experience about the topic that they're discussing. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was newer to that model. I was asked to first kind of shadow a few other groups and programs and, of course, I could only go to the ones that I had lived experience with. Mm. And so I went to, I went to a number of them, but the one that really strikes, you know, that stands out in my memory and I can remember it even to this moment was a grief group. And so it was a grief group of, you know, led by a facilitator that had lived experience and other folks there. And so, you know, at this time I'm in my mid twenties and I'm thinking, okay, what am I going to share uh, there because I have to have lived experience and I feel like I've experienced grief, but you know, I thought I was going to share about experiencing 
grief of myself, different mm. parts of myself that I that have changed and, and, and I've lost. And I showed up and there was just so much grief in the room mm. that I actually spent the whole time crying. Mm-hmm. <laughs> crying in the corner, um, unable to share or not willing to share because I wanted to give the other participants who, uh, who, whose grief was so near and so close, uh, you know, these are, you know, significant loss, um, people very important in their lives that happened, you know, weeks right. to months ago. And so I wanted to give them the space, um, in doing that. And it was at that moment, I remember thinking, you know, maybe I shouldn't have signed on. This mm-hmm. is, this is not for me. You know, what kind of, uh, you know, example am I setting, you know, mm-hmm. by, by sitting in the room and, and, and being upset for, for that time. And interestingly, when mm-hmm. I went to my supervisor about it, uh, you know, she was very kind and understanding. And she kind of had said to me, you know, I'd be more worried if you didn't cry mm-hmm. or, you, or you were not at all impacted by those shares. Right. And and sort of encouraged me to to keep going. And so, yeah, it was it, it was still a struggle, but that was one definitely, you know, one of many times that I remember thinking as well am I the right person to do this? Yeah. And that's so powerful, right? <clears throat> and brave of you to have approached her and said, Hey, I just cried through this session. I was, I was a peer support worker in, um, cause you feel like it could go either way. And later on in this episode, we'll talk a bit about, you know, certain careers and regulatory bodies that, you know, em- embrace this to a certain extent. And then also, you know, come down and say, wait a second, if you show too much emotion, you know, we question your competence or things like that. So it, it can, um, it can be difficult to navigate. And I mean, I are on the side of more and more heart, the better. So I'm happy that you responded <laughs> in that way. Um, and it's led you to really interesting places. Now, if we, if we fast forward a little bit and you are a teaching and learning consultant at Conestoga with me, um, and you tend to teach a lot of equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging style workshops. So very, very, I'd say, you know, of the folks on our team, we all, we all dip our toes into these ones, but, um, you know, up until this point, you've taken on the majority of these particularly charged subject matters. And so I'm curious, you know, when you're teaching these, we'll just call it EDI for short, equity, diversity, inclusion workshops and courses, have you felt similar sort of inclination or pressure to share parts of your identity or your lived experience when approaching this work with learners? Yeah, um, I have, but it's the same kind of dance that I make, uh, that I experienced years ago, right? Because it's, there's some things, it's a bit different in the sense that in the mental health work, it's one of those identities that are, is not necessarily visible to the eye, Mm -hmm. right? So we could be walking around interacting with lots of individuals and I have no idea if they have a diagnosis or, you know, if they choose to hide, I don't know if they're even having a bad day, but when you walk into a space where it's a diversity training, anti-racism training, or you're talking about inclusion practices, um, you know, I can't, I can't make invisible the things that are, are to the naked eye. Right. Mm-hmm. So this notion that, uh, you know, I am a woman, I'm a woman of color, um, I'm biracial. And so a, a little bit ethnically ambiguous to most folks. Um, and you know, some of the other things that I share, uh, Either it comes as a surprise or, or I always find whatever I share that's personal can either and oftentimes simultaneously bring some participants or learners closer to me or relate to me more. And at the same time, others may then, you know, kind of view me as, oh, that's a very different perspective. And mm-hmm. I'm not sure it's one that I adhere to. So there is still definitely that tension um, and, and we know this from, from research as well, right. With, with, with EDI work and any facilitators in those areas, how their identities, um, kind of show up in any sort of diversity training spaces. And, and, you know, there's some, there's some research that talks about how co-facilitation is one of the best ways and, and specifically interracial co-facilitation so that, you know, these different points can be addressed and even the tension um, you know, can be addressed and role modeled through the facilitators. I mean, I even think about myself as a learner, 
in some of those environments, it would seem strange to have this content shared by someone who, you know, doesn't have <laughs> lived experience of different marginal identities. Um, but then at the same time, have a lot of empathy for educators who you think, wow, like that's a lot to carry. Not only have you had these <laughs> experiences in the real world that have caused marginalization and, um, you know, probably a plethora of examples that you could bring forward, but that's so hard to do, right? If you're, <laughs> you're drawing on your own experience and examples to, to illustrate these points or highlight a theory and make it more concrete, that's also got to take an emotional toll to kind of relive those stories all the time. So I like, I like what you're saying about this move to maybe co-facilitation. If there is someone, you know, maybe, you know, I've heard often, you know, a, a person of color and then someone who's, who's white that are co-facilitating. And mm -hmm. so if complex discussions about like anti-right racism come up, you know, they, the facilitators can respond to those together. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an interesting model because it's not something that it's very, uh, common, right. Mm -hmm. In this line of work, we often, um, and they talk about that in, in the research as well about how there are, there are obstacles to co-facilitation, right. Yeah. Um, because you need, you know, instead of just having one individual who's well-versed, you do need two now. Um, and so that, that is, you know, that puts a little bit more strain on the resources, um, so th there are kind of systemic pieces to that, but it's interesting how, you know, this kind of work, as we talked about teaching or, or working around emotionally charged topics, um, you know, comes back to this, this notion of, you know, what is emotional work? What is, mm -hmm. what is, uh, emotional labor? What is emotional management? Right. Mm -hmm. So these kind of concepts that, that, um, are, are very much a part of the human experience, but can be distinguished between um, like emotional work is is the work that we all do every day, right? So it's part of being a human. We each have our emotions that we navigate on the day-to-day -day basis in different circumstances, whether we're at work, with our family, with friends, et cetera. Emotional labor is that additional piece where as part of your profession, you're expected to navigate emotions, Right. And so you can think of numerous um, professions where that's just part of the work that you do, mm. right? Like customer service type <laughs> things where you're always, you know, supposed to be smiley and yeah. teaching. So <laughs> teaching, teaching is one of those pieces, customer service, uh, uh, therapy work, um, anything around, let's say, even, you know, crisis or emergency, right? You're expected um, if you're if you're working on a 911 call, right, right. facilitated on the call, you expect you can't be you have to be navigating your own emotions when someone else is having a crisis, a paramedic, perhaps these types of things as well. So that would be emotional labor, like jobs that really require a high amount of emotional labor. Yeah. Yeah. So and, you know, there's there's a lot of discussion as, you know, with teaching. Can there be emotional labor in that as well? Because mm -hmm. I think it would be really different depending on what you're teaching, yeah. right? If you're teaching topics that are a bit more objective, uh, perhaps like math, yeah. right? Um, that's a very different uh, connection to the emotional labor it might take yeah. versus teaching all those disciplines that I talked about. Yeah. And have you found, I mean, in your own experience, because you do a lot of EDI <laughs> style courses, but you also teach other things, right? So mm -hmm. would you say, if you compare when you're teaching uh, you know, course about diversity and inclusion um, and equity versus, you know, teaching faculty how to use a high flex classroom. Would you say one has more emotional labor than another? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you pick that one because the, the, <laughs> it's something that has different, you know, different forms of emotional labor, right? Hmm. Well, for me, definitely the inclusion ones uh, would have more emotional labor for myself. Um, but it also depends. There's this other piece of, you know, how much emotionality comes in with the use of technology. Right. Or, right? And so there, there's that. But I find that when I'm teaching other topics, let's say I'm teaching about rubrics mm -hmm. or, um, you know, assessments and navigating marking, um, there isn't as much emotionality in those topics. Right. right? And so I feel that too as a facilitator. And I imagine it's not just me. I imagine the learners in the, in the, you know, in the learning space yeah. feel that as well, right. As they experience learnings about diversity and inclusion versus rubrics. Mm 
Yeah. Yeah. And okay. and there's research that shows that, right? Mm-hmm. That different individuals in, in diversity training will have, you know, kind of different experiences and, and impact the way they show up. Yeah. The way they show up. And I, I'm thinking like even the way they lesson plan, right? Like if you're teaching a business math course, you could probably in the spur of the moment, you know, if students are struggling with a particular formula, you could just think up an example, right? And write it on the board, whatever it might be. I found, you know, when I'm teaching other emotionally charged types of courses, like I'm really careful with lesson planning. Like I'm always thinking in advance, okay, what is the best example I can use here to illustrate this point that's, you know, not going to be hugely controversial, but will still get us into the deep discussion that I'm hoping it's really hard to do sort of in the moment. So I find like even some of that emotional labor is like before you're with other human bodies, kind of in anticipation of what reactions might be. Yeah. And I think it's really interesting because, you know, Lauren and I, we've done lots of um, training opportunities for faculty here at Conestoga, one of which is the instructional skills workshop, Mm -hmm. where we do kind of a model and we, we, we get teachers and faculty to try out teaching topics that maybe, you know, they don't actually teach at the college, but they might be more passionate about. And one area we always say is, you know, try, try teaching a topic that falls into, you know, what I call the head, the heart and the body. Mm. Right. So teach something that's more cognitive. Maybe it's a theory, uh, you know, maybe it's, it's, you know, more objective and then teach something that's a bit more, um, you know, the body part is, is, is more, you know, psychomotor skills. So maybe you're mm. teaching in the trade or you're teaching a skill, or you're teaching in the PSW or the nursing and it's interacting with clients. Um, or maybe you're teaching a new exercise program. Mm. But then there's also one other part, which is teaching to the heart, right? Which is how can we teach uh, to the affective domain and how does that show up in all these different areas, Mm -hmm. right? So you can teach the steps for a PSW to, you know, carry out a skill with a client or a patient, or you can teach the steps for how a paramedic should be taking care of, uh, you know, an injured, injured individual in front of them. But how do we also teach them the emotional side? So what do they do when the injured individual in front of them is having an emotional breakdown? Yeah. Right. There are no steps that we can follow. There might be steps, but we would have to in, in kind of um, improv, right, in the yeah. situation. And the same thing with in other areas. And I've had, you know, a number of people in these in these trainings who have never taught or their main area is more cognitive or skill based. And they start teaching these these heart areas, these mm. affective domains. and what I've noticed is they'll say that, wow, I'm nervous and I feel emotional in Mm. the process. Right. Um, and sometimes, you know, I, I kind of cheekily say, well, welcome to my world. Right. When (laughs) I, when I teach these things, you know, because you never know how they're going to go. And and there's a different layer of kind of vulnerability when you know, you're teaching about something that is less objective, perhaps. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they, they appear less frequently, right. These kind of affective learning outcomes on, course designs. But I think one of the things that we're certainly looking at with this research and and we find with faculty is even if they're not spelled out on there, you know, you might be teaching and maybe one of the unit outcomes is, you know, define systemic racism. Mm -hmm. That's a cognitive outcome. But when you're actually teaching that in class, that's an affective, you know, you've got to, you've got to factor in people's feelings when teaching about something like that. And so it's almost this like hidden curriculum in a lot of courses where actually, yeah, there is this, this heart-based kind of feeling component to it. Yeah. And it's interesting that you bring that up because I think that is a key piece of the tension, Mm -hmm. right? Because we have these course outcomes um, as well as, you know, courses where we want students to learn a generalized learning, right? Let's say, you know, what's the system, I don't know, going on your, on your example of um, a course learning outcome of understanding systemic racism, right? We can talk about research findings, but to really humanize them, yeah. then we have to put in some stories. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's that tension of how much of the personal side right? Like the individual stories, because it's easy to kind of say, maybe that's just one story. Yeah. Right. Um, But then it's also easy to say, well, that's a whole bunch of research on a number of people, but that's not what it looks like here where I am or in my world. Yeah. Right. So it's that tension of you need to kind of show these examples of the individual level, whether you're teaching inclusion, mental health, um, or, you know, maybe even healthcare, Mm -hmm. right? Like what happens when on the emotional level, you're a paramedic and, you, you know, 
how's that supporting the client or the patient at the time or as a PSW or a nurse, you know, how does that impact that individual? And on the system, on the larger scale, this is what we see with patterns and trends, mm-hmm. right? And so I think that's part of it and and almost why we are, you know, we talked about how we're moving towards people with more lived experience in the classroom to kind yeah. of bring that personal piece um, because it's different to learn about something that's far out there that doesn't involve you. Absolutely, right? And it, and you can see how it could enhance learning. Of course, it could, you know, if a faculty member is sharing their own experience of systemic racism, that could promote buy-in, right? Like suddenly the students, like their heart is involved. They're saying, oh my goodness, this prof who I care a lot about is telling me what happened to them three weeks ago. Um, and so, you know, on the one hand, yeah, it makes those bigger, more abstract, you know, zoomed out research numbers um, more meaningful and memorable to students. Um, and then, you know, I think too, can create a classroom community where if, if it is a prof who's sharing some of these things, um, it can create dialogue, right? It can open up space to say to students, you know, I've shared, I've shared Mm -hmm. this, nobody's forced to share anything private, of course, but like there, you know, if you have an example that you want to bring forward too, that's sort of welcome within this community and is going to enrich and enhance everybody's learning. Mm -hmm. But then of course, um, it's then the faculty's job to hold that and hold that space for, for everyone who does share. Right. And that doesn't just end when class ends at four o'clock. It's like, that's, you know, you're probably going to get emails later that night. And, um, it's a lot of extra, again, emotional labor and actual just time, <laughs> time consuming labor to, to take on too. Absolutely. And I think it, it, it hits on these kinds of topics. One of the reasons why, you know, of course we're so interested in emotionally charged or complex topics is because there are a few other things that come with with teaching these types of topics, right? One is um, we know from the research as well as our own experiences in the classroom, and we'll hear from more faculty this season. Um, but as we learn about these things, because they're not just, you know, some abstract fact or theory, it's something that can be applied to our lives and and this emotional piece, um, we we're seeing we see that, you know, you can learn something in class, but you're not necessarily going to get a black and white answer, Mm -hmm. right? You're not going to get a right or wrong answer. You're going to get a framework to explore something. And so there's this notion of, you know, uh, accepting non-closure, right? Mm -hmm. You can spend a whole, whole semester exploring a topic and you have some learnings, of course, and you meet the course outcomes. Um, but then you show up and you have to apply those learnings and you do have to kind of, you know, go with a different system or, or go with what's there. Yeah. And um, another thing that we know from the research anyways, is that, uh, is that learners in the process will start reflecting on their own process, mm. right. And their own emotions in, in that. And that's a big part of the learning. Yeah. And so facilitators or faculty can kind of um, make a space for that to happen in the classroom but that's something that's ongoing. It's not something that an outcome is met and then it's not, you know, kind of looked at as much later on. Yeah, certainly not as easily measured, right? It's we're talking yeah. people's values and experiences and perspectives on the world and how that's going to inform who they are, you know, as a democratic citizen yeah. <laughs> in whatever workplace they show up to. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so it, I mean, to me, it's just fascinating territory, I find. And especially this kind of, you know, when I see you at work delivering these things, I think, wow, like Sarah is such a great person (laughs) for this, for this kind of work. And I think, you know, there's this sort of feeling amongst a lot of folks who teach these topics, like there is a bit of a calling or like, okay, I, I know this in my bones and I, I want to share this. And I, you know, I, I am really capable of finding ways. And if something doesn't go as planned, like I, I know I can read the room and have that affective heart-based component and I'll, and I'll switch things up. Um, you know, so there's that, but then there's also, and we're going to talk more later about this kind of identity tax, right? This kind mm-hmm. of what, what does this labor cost um, in the long run? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, well... We've talked a lot about me, Lauren, but I'd love to to hear more about you as well. I know, you know, I've watched you teach a lot of uh, sort of difficult, emotionally charged topics as well. And so tell me a little bit about your entry points. 
uh, tell me, let's start with maybe, you know, what sort of experience do you have teaching difficult subject matters? Sure. Well, I mean, I started like, um, as a youngster, I was very involved in arts and theater, um, and sort of pursued, you know, kind of acting work for a while, um, and got pretty lucky with that early on in my career. Um, and I remember a lot of people sort of joking, like, oh, you know, we'll see you at the Oscars one day or you'll be famous. And I, that just didn't resonate with me. I was like, I don't want to be famous. Like, I don't, I actually really don't like the industry part of this. I just really like telling stories. Like, I really mm -hmm. like having an excuse to like take people to deep <laughs> places and, and, you know, explore these conflicts sort of with the safety of a character. Um, so I feel like just early on, I, I had that sense of like just the importance of storytelling and how powerful it could be. Um, I ended up moving away from that industry because there were lots of parts I, I really didn't like and were not for me. Um, and then did a, a master's in international development. And my research for that degree was very much focused on trauma. So I was working with um, uh, folks, refugees at the Center for Victims of Torture. And so mm -hmm. some really, really amazing stories again. Um, research, the research itself was arts-based once more and really just got me fascinated by trauma and knew there was more to explore there too, which then led me to more um, my doctoral work, which was about military trauma. And throughout the whole thing, I remember thinking like, wow, yeah, there's this sort of the diagnostic and statistical manual definition of what these disorders are, like post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera. But then I was hearing these stories from military veterans and thinking like, it's so much more than that. It's so much more interesting, like genders involved here. This is also about masculinity. This is also about betrayal, like these mm -hmm. like themes of literature and arts, not, you know, n not just what's on the symptom checklist. Yeah. And so um, I, I've just been sort of fascinated again by that that disconnect and what, what stories and lived experience can offer that you don't see in, you know, these kind of more cold <laughs> removed, um, ways of understanding these things. But I suppose one of the moments where I really started to bring myself into some of this work was, so while I was doing my doctoral work, um, obviously my supervisor very much involved with trauma work and, I started to become pretty critical of, you know, the standard way of doing things and narratives about psychiatry. Um, and there was a course that was starting at U of T. It had run for a couple of semesters, but they were looking for an instructor to teach something called mad studies. Mm -hmm. So that's a area of study um, under the umbrella of critical disability. So again, moving away from sort of this individualized medical model, if we think about a disabled person, right? For a long time, it was this idea of, oh, there's this individual that has some sort of deficit with their body and we have to, you know, change their body so they can fit more comfortably into this world. Whereas the social model is a very different approach, right? It's kind of saying, wait a second, there's something wrong with how we've organized <laughs> this world and, and structures around that this particular body doesn't feel like it belongs, um, or it's just so much harder to do things. So um, I was applying that to mental health too, this idea of, wait a second, maybe this isn't an individual <laughs> problem. Um, let's look societally, right? And, and my research with military folks was really taking me there too. Um, and so, you know, I wanted to teach this course. They had this posting, my supervisor said, Oh, Lauren, you'd be perfect for it. Um, and on the application, it really said like, we're looking for someone with lived experience with, with mental illness. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I did feel inclined to disclose at that point, part of my own story that had informed some of my academic work and, uh, you know, just my outlook on life. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, you know, what happened to me when I was 16 years old, I had very severe anorexia nervosa, was forced <laughs> against my will to, um, kind of held in, in this children's hospital to get treatment mm -hmm. for many, many months. Um, and 
I, I still to this day have a really hard time figuring out what I really feel about the situation. And I think basically, like you're saying, there's no actual closure or tidy yeah. conclusion, right? On the one hand, yes, I think it did save my life. Like my vital signs were unstable. I was at a dangerously low weight. I hadn't been able to pull myself out of it in spite of a lot of doctors <laughs> trying to give me advice. Um, so I think it, it saved my life. On the other hand, I remember even in that moment, even in this sort of very starved state, knowing that something was deeply wrong with how I was being treated and the narratives that were um, being put in my mind, right? This idea that you can't trust yourself, like this disorder has taken over and you have to listen to us. Mm -hmm. And again, this very individualized approach, right? It was basically like a weight gain program, no talk. And I was sitting there looking around and seeing all these other young women. Those are the only ones who are in treatment with me. Um, just thinking like, this is kind of a social phenomenon. Like, why is nobody talking about like why there are so many young women just when our bodies are starting to change who feel like we're going to be too big for this world? Like, mm -hmm. there's something more here than just me not wanting to eat that yogurt. Like, what's really going on? And, and there just wasn't space for that. Um, and there's a lot of shame. And, um, so I remember even from that early point, having this kind of insight into the psychiatric system and yeah. And again, being trapped, right. Irving Gossman calls things like this, like these total institutions where you're sort of stripped of your identity and, you know, there's like privileges. I was like, when I reached 65% of my ideal body weight, I was allowed off the unit to like walk around the block with my mom kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so you're working towards this, this whole other structure that you're, um, you're really powerless <laughs> within. Um, and so then that certainly informed my later experience working with folks who have been sort of quote unquote psychiatrized mm -hmm. and you know, the powerlessness that they might feel, especially when you're vulnerable and you want to latch on to sort of a dominant narrative to explain what's happening to you. And you want to trust, you know, people who are put in charge of your care. And at the same time, there's so much research and literature about like, wait a second, these systems are really violent, especially for racialized folks and um, other minorities. Like there's just so much that's problematic about this too. Mm -hmm. Um and so, you know, I was there teaching this class at U of T. I got the job. <laughs> I got that <laughs> great contract. <laughs> um, and then that was a whole other ride, right? Actually being in the room and teaching this content with, for students. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing all of that. I mean, so many, so much curiosity about all those experiences. But let's start with, you know, what was it like to teach this course? This course that seemed to be fairly new in the department, right? A course on math studies. And one that you said was advertised, um, you know, where the instructor, the professor had to have lived experience and, and, you know, you got the job, you disclosed, um, your supervisor, your PhD supervisor is behind you. What was it like actually sharing this content, um, being in that classroom with the students talking about these things that, you know, are a big part of your life. And you say, you know, still have non-closure from that stage, right. In your life. And it still impacts you today. Yeah, I think um, it was intense, <laughs> like partially in the that university setting. I was given the course code and like the time of the class, but was really put in charge of curating all the content, like gathering all the readings. So, I mean, some folks who had taught it previously gave me some tips on articles that had worked really well for them or, or didn't. So I had a bit of guidance there, but it felt like a lot of pressure, especially because it was a course I really believed should be running in the institution, kind of this counter narrative thing um, to other mental health related courses that offered at U of T. This was an important perspective, but then, you know, really wanted it to go well <laughs> so that it would keep running. Um, and then of course, really being sensitive to the fact that I had about like, I think 35 students or so, and half of them I'd say, um, I mean, I think almost all of them had had some sort of lived experience with, with men or diagnosed with mental illness. And about half of them were pretty attached to the label of their diagnosis for great reasons, right? It brought them community. It brought them, you know, sort of uh, destigmatized things mm -hmm. uh, in a way, realizing they're not alone and putting names on things. Yeah, I mean, that's that's such an interesting piece, right? Because, you know, for our listeners and, and most people who teach might know this, but you know, your students do not have to disclose to take the course. No, definitely not. Right? No. <laughs> they don't have to do that yet. 
So they get to choose. I assume if you can speak a little, was it like a, uh, was it um, a course that clearly it wasn't part of a program, right? They could. Yeah, it wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't a mandatory course for anyone. It was within the equity studies department. So it was an option of of a few electives that they could Mm -hmm. take. Yeah. Yeah. And and yet we're seeing, you know, just like you said, at this as this at during this experience um, that, you know, certain students, students are self-selecting to go in. Right. And so now the faculty, you at this stage are is navigating these different pieces, your identity, but also the identities of the learners. Exactly. Yeah. And so half of them kind of, yeah, really attach their diagnosis, great relationships with their psychiatrists. And then the other half, really complicated relationships within the system, the psychiatric system. And again, really good reasons <laughs> as to why they rejected a label, a specific diagnosis, um, had had some violent interactions, you know, with with people who they were told were there to care for them. So there was this, it was a really fascinating tightrope. I felt like I was walking, Mm -hmm. wanting to create a space where everyone was open to share and both realities could exist at the same time. We could critique and also, you know, celebrate that, that it had been helpful for some people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I can imagine, right. That that would be, um, like you said, walking a tightrope and it could be contentious. So how did you navigate that Lauren? I think, I mean, and this is one thing I'm really looking forward to talking with faculty about, um, you know, over the course of this podcast and the bigger research project is like, okay, what do you do in the class? Like, what do you actually, how do you approach these subject matters? So one thing, you know, one method I used, um, was a sort of interactive, we would look at Bell Let's Talk, you know, those campaigns, the sort of mental health campaigns. Um, we'd show a video, you know, that's really, you know, Bell kind of saying, this is so great. And, uh, so we'd look at it and we'd, we'd discuss together, okay, does this narrative ring true? This idea that, you know, you can have, have this kind of suffering in some way, you know, accept treatment. And then that's the end of the story. Like, is that true? Or is it more of a continuum? Does, you know, and so one like that provided a lot of space for people to, to share. Mm -hmm. Um, I did share parts of my own story, right. Especially when we're talking about some of these big terms and concepts like total institution and what, what that's really like. Um, because I knew that students would sort of from day one, there was a willingness on, on many of their parts to, to work through some of this trauma, um, or to explore these parts of their identities that were sort of new, new to them, um, Mm -hmm. and that they wanted to be loud and proud about. So, uh, yeah, it was fascinating. And so I did. And I mean, the final project, again, I had control over what that assessment would be. So right. they had options, right? They could do, you know, a final paper, a research paper, or they could do a more artistic thing. So there are pretty clear guidelines and some freedom with respect to what that would look like. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I mean, I think, I think it's important for me to say too, I, anorexia is one of those diagnoses. I mean, not all the time, obviously people can, um, appear to be at a healthy weight and still be suffering from it. But I sometimes ask myself, like if my experience in the mental health system had been for something else, that's more stigmatized, like, you know, schizophrenia, something like that, would I have been as willing to disclose? Would I be here Mm -hmm. talking about that now? I feel part of the reason I can is because people who know me can see that I'm, you know, healthy in the world. Mm And, um, it's something that's that's pretty much behind me. Whereas, you know, for other professionals, there's a lot of literature about how um, this can be more challenging, right? So we'll talk more throughout the future episodes, but someone like Jennifer Poole, who works in, in the, show, the social work field and who's disclosed what she calls her madness, mm-hmm. um, you know, she talks a lot about uh, you know, questions of fitness that uh, regulatory bodies impose upon people. There's also some scholars doing brilliant work like Simon Adams in nursing, Adam Davies, he teaches at the University of Guelph um, uh, in early childhood education. Mm -hmm. And these areas where we think, okay, yeah, if you're going to be working with vulnerable people, what, you know, is disclosing dangerous for you? What are people going to going to think about you, even if you know deep down it's really an asset and that that helps you bring a lot more to your patients, to your students, whatever, um, you know, there, there still are very real professional dangers. Yeah, for sure. It kind of comes back to this idea of, you know, like we were saying, um, having lived experience to get the job, mm-hmm. but then also kind of, you know, what kind of toll might it take on you? Right. 
this notion of identity tax um, or, or, you know, that comes back to a, a big sociological concept that's, you know, identity theory. Mm. Um, and so I'm just going to share a little bit about that and then ask you perhaps if you want to share a bit on that as well. But this idea that, you know, we all have multiple identities, right? And these identities are not all equal. There's kind of a, a hierarchy or a structure to them based on the context that we're in. So for example, you know, um, when a person is with their parent, let's say I'm with my mother, I'm a child first, mm -hmm. right? But if I'm with a child or my child, then I'm a parent first, right? And we know that's the case for faculty as well, that when they're in the classroom or when they're teaching, they're teachers or educators first, they're faculty first. And then we want to know how, you know, so we have these identities, but when we're expected to kind of step out of that role and share our experience, our lived experience, right? Are we a faculty at that point mm. or are we someone who has experienced institutionalization? Are we someone who has experienced systemic racism? Are we someone who has experienced mental health or mental illness? Yeah. Right. How do we balance those pieces? And this kind of comes to, to this idea of, you know, uh, this notion of identity taxation, right? Mm -hmm. And so identity taxation um, has been coined and defined as, you know, where faculty members um, shoulder or they have an additional labor or emotional labor. Uh, it can be emotional, it could be physical, it could be mental. Um, but that labor is strongly tied to their membership of historically marginalized groups, right? So that could be their race, their gender, um, you know, lived experience of mental health, et cetera. And that kind of emotional, physical, and mental labor goes beyond what is expected of other faculties, uh, act, other faculty members, pardon me, in the same setting, mm -hmm. right? And, and similarly, this definition of identity taxation is so closely tied to another um, term that came out in, you know, closer to 1994, which is cultural taxation, which talks about the additional race-based service work um, that uh, faculty members of color, uh, you know, are expected to kind of do. It falls on their shoulders and it's less likely to be taken up by white faculty members. And when you're saying service-based things, this is like not just your teaching, but like sitting on certain committees, <laughs> that type of thing, right? Yeah. So they talk about, you know, identity taxation as, you know, service assignments. So s serving on additional committees because of their identity, um, teaching colleagues about race and gender and differences, assuming more of a mother role mm -hmm. uh, for students and faculty. That's one that's tied a bit more to, you know, identities with gender, right? Women. Um, and also kind of being uh, working as an intermediary or a mediator almost between, um, you know, different sort of identities on campus that, that maybe then kind of refer to you in that piece. Right. Yeah. And I'm sure we're going to get into some of these things with, with our faculty member guests as well. For sure. Yeah. I'm thinking, Sarah, maybe we'll we'll wrap it up there for now. And uh, yeah, we'll delve more deeply into this literature um, based on what what our guests bring forward. Absolutely. I'm excited to hear from them and and how these concepts uh, show up in their life and in their teaching. Well, we've come to the end of another episode of My Favorite Lesson, a podcast hosted by Teaching and Learning at Conestoga. You can find other episodes in this series and more by visiting Teaching and Learning at Conestoga College on YouTube and by following My Favorite Lesson on Spotify. Subscribe to be notified each time a new episode becomes available. And for 24-7 support for all things teaching and learning related, please check out our faculty learning hub at tlconestoga.ca. And with that, I'm Dr. Lauren Spring. And I'm Dr. Sarah Kafashan. And we'll see you next time.